everyone, welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us. Her name is Stella Han. Stella is the co-founder and CEO of Fractional, the first social platform for fractional ownership of real estate. Fractional empowers people to co-own investment real estate with friends and others in an inclusive, collaborative, and hassle-free way. The software guides investors from discovery to acquisition to management, especially in a group setting. Fractional has raised $5.5 million in funding on a $30 million valuation from Y Combinator, CRV, Will Smith, Kevin Durant, and others. Before Fractional, Stella was a senior software engineer at a firm where she built and scaled pre-qualification and payment processing systems and the lead integration with Walmart and Shopify, a firm's two biggest partnerships. Stella graduated from Carnegie Mellon University in 2018, where she studied computer science. Stella, welcome to the show. Stella, we're so excited to have you in the podcast today. Can you tell us a little bit more about your upbringing? What, what was that like? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Stella. So glad to be here today. Um, a little bit more about my upbringing. Um, so I was born and raised in the Bay Area um, in East Bay in Fremont, California. Um, very Asian, densely populated place. Um, grew up as the only child. Um, my mom was really into real estate investing and my parents flipped a lot of houses. So that was part of my life growing up, kind of being Asian, cheap family labor, doing a lot of the work. Um, so I think that's also, you know, what led to a lot of um, about, you know, how I'm building my company today. Um, but other than that, I studied a lot of arts and music growing up. Um, at one point, um, considered being a classical violinist. Um, ended up studying computer science at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. So I did get um, four really good uh, years of really brutal winter um, and actually feeling what Four Seasons is like. Um, and after Carnegie Mellon, I joined a firm, which is this fintech consumer lending startup as a software engineer, um, worked there for around two and a half years on um, consumer lending products, building pre-qualification, identity verification, payment processing, all of the good, you know, deep fintech technologies. Um, and then after that, uh, recently founded my own company called Fractional, um, where we're building a social platform for fractional ownership of real estate. I love it. Fractional is such it's making a lot of waves in our all of our community, Asian Hustle Network, Subtle Asian Real Estate. It's it's amazing what you what you build in such a short amount of time. But out of curiosity too, like what what did your parents say about entrepreneurship in general? I, lo I always love hearing this question because when I brought up to my parents when I first left my job, they're like, We came to America for you to quit your job for uncertainty. What are you doing? <laughs> You know, so I'm kind of curious about what your parents said about you, uh, about your entrepreneur journey. Yeah, so my dad is an entrepreneur. Um, so he's been running his own company in China for a little over a decade now. Um, so I think because of that, naturally, my parents are, are very supportive and, um, you know, very encouraging in terms of me going out to, to build my own thing. Um, and I, I would say, you know, from a real estate pr perspective, you know, they're entrepreneurs of their own as well in terms of building a business in, in you know, rental properties and, and having passive income that way. So they've, they've always been supportive. Um, it was it was definitely interesting um, because when I when I was in college, I actually started a um, an elder tech company where I was building a common application for seniors and their families to onboard and apply to different senior facilities. And that actually came from, um, you know, a struggle within our family in terms of helping my grandparents find senior care. Um, and when I was building that, um, I think it was also really empowering for my parents to see something um, where I was building a solution that, you know, impacted our family um, and also, you know, impacted so many other families across the U.S. Um, so in that way, I think they've always given me a lot of support. And that's definitely, you know, helped me feel more motivated um, to always have them behind my back. I really love that, too. And it really shows each other that you are capable of running your own business one day. Right. It's all about that trust. It's about all right, can, can Stella do this? At the end of the day, like our parents really want us to be happy and like live really like fulfilled full life. That's just, that's really what they want. And they're def most of the time their definition is like, that's being a lawyer, that's being a doctor, that's being an engineer. Like these, these type of roles that, you know, it's security at the end of the day, right? And I really like the fact that every single, every single thing that you built so far, you draw so much inspiration from your family. You know, your, your grandparents looking for like a, a care, like an elderly care home. And 
now your current company too. Like your parents are in real estate. You started a real estate company. And let's, let's walk us through that journey real quick. Like how did this idea come about? How did you realize at what, what, like at what point did you guys find product market fit and that you wanted to do this full time? Yeah, totally. Um, so I was always, you know, really into real estate investing. I also think it means a lot in terms of, you know, overall as a whole to the Asian culture and Asian community. Um, so, you know, that was a big deal to my family. Also, just a lot of people around us in terms of, you know, how they built wealth. Um, so naturally, I think it was ingrained in me that I wanted to get into real estate investing at one point in my life. Um, and because of that, um, I always talked about, you know, real estate investing with my friends and my coworkers. And when I was working at a firm, uh, my current co-founder, Carlos, he was on the same team and I was um, also came from a real estate investing family. His parents are in the construction business in Mexico. Um, so we talked a lot about real estate investing, buying homes whenever we had lunch and dinner at the office. Um, and naturally, that kind of just converted into the two of us wanting to form a partnership where we pulled our money together um, to buy real estate properties together for investment purposes. You know, it just made a lot of sense in terms of, you know, sharing responsibility and sharing risk and also having a lower cost of entry when it comes to, to real estate ownership. Um, so we started out by um, forming a partnership amongst the two of us where we bought land together in Mexico um, and we developed these four retail storefronts on it. Um, overall, it was a great financial success. You know, we were cash flowing. The project was running really well. Um, and we we're just sharing this story and this journey with a lot of our friends and family and coworkers. And so many people were just coming to us and saying, you know, they thought about doing the exact same thing with their friends, with their coworkers, their college housemates. Um, but what really stopped them was just, you know, all the logistics, the friction that can come with, you know, forming a partnership, running a project together. Um, and people kind of, you know, chicken out. They they stepped back and they were like, you know, this sounds like too much for us to, to get started. Um, so we were like, you know, hey, we did this. Like, do you want to use our legal paperwork? Like, we've done the entire process. We can help you. Um, so we managed to get um, a couple of friends on board um, where they decided to jump on with their friends and we were just helping them through the process. And then things basically like started clicking in our heads and we were like, you know, this seems like such an obvious answer to so many people when they want to break into real estate ownership and real estate investing. Like naturally, they think about wanting to do this with their friends and people they trust. Um, it's really just, you know, the friction that's so overwhelming, that's taking such an obvious solution away from folks. And we thought, you know, both of us, we're software engineers. Um, we've been operating in the fintech industry. We know, you know, real estate why don't we bring technology into all of this and build actually a software platform that can abstract away all of the friction that comes from a partnership? Uh, so we got this idea, uh, made essentially this like very bare bones like landing page with just a questionnaire behind it, um, posted it on this app called Blind, which is like this anonymous network for a lot of busy professionals. Oftentimes, you know, they're kind of talking about their work culture, their total comp, a lot of things like that. Um, but it ended up, you know, being a target demographic for us. Um, so we, when we posted our landing page on Blind, we actually got 2,000 people to sign up um, on that landing page just right off the bat. Um, and that's pretty much when we knew, you know, we were onto something. Um, so that gave us, you know, the leap of faith to start building the company. Um, we applied a Y Combinator, got in. Um, so starting from January of this year, we quit our jobs and, and started building fractional full time. I love that story a lot. And I love it because I also come from a real estate background as well. So it's like, oh, wow, that's such an obvious solution. You know, like every, everybody wants to get into real estate. Like everybody's just always in the back of their mind. If you're Asian plus one, you know, your mom, your mom never are going to talk about it. Right. The fact that you, you took the idea and you thought about it in a way that that is genius. Like you're like, okay, like you think about your own, you use you basically use yourself and, and Carlos as like, like like target audience first. Like, okay, when you're working together, you want to work with friends and whatnot. And I really like the mentality shift a lot because when you speak to like older Asian generation, they're always like, don't do business with your friends, like you're gonna ruin relationships. All those, yes, it is true back then, but nowadays it's like, you know what, you want to do business with people that you trust and i really like the fact that you went forward with this so let's let's talk a little more about the actual start so now actually wait, let's talk a little more about when you got the 2000 people on your list that's only the starting point right there's so much that goes into it after that how do you create a better experience for your users after getting the, the name list right okay like 
do you, do you guys start up by writing surveys? Do you guys start by talking to them? How what was the time commitment like at that point while having your job and being like, oh crap, we have two thousand people sign up in our for our product. Like we have to have a product now, right? What was the thought process behind that in the, in the initial reaction of what do, what what you need to do next? What you needed to do, to do next? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and kind of you know going along the point that you were saying before, um, I think you know. Being our own customers, it helped a lot. You know where we've gone through the entire process, and we understand you know where people have the most headaches. Um, and a lot of our friends, you know, they were first-time real estate investors, so we were hand-holding them throughout the entire process. We got to see you know where they struggled the most and where they needed you know more touch from a company, and where we should be putting more emphasis in terms of you know what products we build first and how do we prioritize you know being able to provide such a full-service solution to you know owning real estate. And not only doing that, but also with the group as well. Um, so a lot of that, you know, I think it gave us a lot of the initial ideas on what to focus on. Um, but obviously, as we, you know, iterated on the product and started onboarding more and more beta users, um, it is such a process to continuously go back and seek feedback, um, especially, you know, when we want to build a really sticky product um, and not just have people transact once on the platform, but being able to come back, want to see how their investment is doing, um, interacting with their other co-owners, the property, and then coming back for more, you know, growing with the platform, um, expanding their portfolio as a real estate investor and also their confidence as well. Um, and that's pretty much like what led into um, this recent, you know, big release that we've done, which is adding a social component to what we've been building. Um, you know, now we're putting a lot of emphasis on actually creating a trusted community on the fractional platform as well where people are able to meet, you know, other like-minded investors, more experienced investors, be able to, you know, talk to folks, learn from other people, um, and, and really like form their, form their own group of trusted partners who they can, you know, jump into future deals with. Um, I think there's so much in terms of creating a network for people to learn and collaborate together um, and being able to like congregate all of that in the fractional community. That's something that we've been really, really bullish on recently um, and putting a lot of efforts into developing. Great idea. I think that's absolutely very smart. It almost feels like a, like a bigger pockets 2.0 type of feeling. <laughs> for those, yep. of you guys that, those of you guys that don't know, bigger pockets is a pretty awesome platform to get into real estate, but it doesn't, it doesn't do what fractional does in terms of like getting people started with the right resources. It's a lot of like, okay, there's, you get, you join a community and you self-learn, but I feel like your platform is like, you're guiding me to invest. And that's, that's awesome. Right. Um, so I'm kind of curious too. So after you got the name list and you got the, the signups and you know, you're thinking about like priorities of what features to build out first, how did you guys think about regulations in terms of like accepting investor money or, and like what what like the chicken and egg situations like do you go out there and search for properties first do you gather out the money first like i just want to hear all about that because it's so interesting to me yes those are really really great questions um so from a regulations perspective that was definitely you know very top of mind for us especially since carlos and i both came from a firm being a fintech company you know regulations, all of that compliance, really important. So always top of mind. Um, so right off the bat, we were working with real estate lawyers. And we also brought in an SEC lawyer and advisor as well. Um, so every time, you know, we're building new products, uh, we operated with, um, you know, product guidelines in terms of how we wanted to stay compliant with real estate law and SEC law. Um, so that definitely, you know, I think it provided a lot of guidance in terms of product direction. Um, and then in terms of kind of the chicken and egg problem, you know, how we thought about our business model and building all of that. Um, one thing that we did, you know, reflect a lot on was existing crowdfunding models. Um, for example, you know, Fundrise or REITs, those have been in the ecosystem for a while already. Um, and for those who don't know, crowdfunding traditionally, the companies themselves, they would actually acquire the properties using their own capital. Um, and then they would turn it into a security and then try to sell shares of properties that they already own um, to, you know, retail investors or consumers out on the internet. Um, so that pretty much poses like, you know, this really daunting challenge where the companies are pretty much like at the mercy of retail investors to buy back shares of properties that they've put a lot of upfront money on. Um, and that ends up being a game of, you know, 
is this the right property for people? And do people trust this fund enough to, to give their money and, and buy these shares? And that to us, it just really didn't, you know, to us fundamentally, it wasn't a business model that scaled. Um, what we thought was really interesting was, you know, to pull together people that were like-minded, um, that wanted to, you know, go into similar investment projects together and then find them the right deals that are on the market or through off-market um, that, you know, our agent partners or even their agent partners were bringing on. And we would essentially almost act as like a SaaS platform for forming partnerships and managing partnerships um, to be able to, you know, streamline entity formation when it comes to LLCs, co-ownership legal agreements, handling the logistics of closing, financing, managing the bank account afterwards, all of that, where, you know, we gave people control for, you know, the people they want to work with, the properties they want to own. Um, but then we abstract away like the complications. Um, so really it helps us scale as a company because we're doing, you know, the software and the technology part that we're good at. Um, and then we're, you know, de-risking ourselves in terms of not having to, you know, raise a lot of debt to buy properties up front. We're just allowing people to, you know, form partnerships to acquire whatever they want to acquire. That's so smart. That's very, very smart. It, it, the whole incident sort of just reminded me of like the, I forgot if it's like Redfin or Zillow, that they end up buying a lot of properties and they couldn't sell it and they end up selling for like cheaper prices. I, I think that's that's excellent. That's that's actually one of the first times I heard that, that the yeah, partnerships is like the core of, of everything. And like the fact you turned to a SaaS company and you made the whole process easier. Damn, I can see why, why you guys picked up so much momentum now. That's genius. I gotta, I gotta give you your flowers. This says hella smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of thinking behind user scalability, scaling machine as a company and what's the right process to do that. So we, we decided, you know, taking the balance sheet heavy business model was not the right way to, to build our type of business. Yeah, that's, that's super smart. At, at any point, did you like talk to your mom and dad or parents, uh, like talk to your parents about like, that type of strategy and what what they had to say about about what you want to build like they're, where they're like stella you you need to go out there and acquire property and inform this syndication and, and reads and all that stuff or like you know, you know what it's too complicated just focus on the SaaS side did you consult your, your parents for help i did seek their feedback in terms of like drawing upon their personal experiences um, cause my parents, they did invest in, you know, syndicates as well, where they were only the LP. So basically like someone else ran the project. Um, and obviously, you know, my parents also run their own projects. So I was, you know, kind of picking their, picking their brains around, you know, how they felt around running their own projects versus, you know, putting their money with another syndicate or another fund and having someone else lead it. Um, and, and feedback they did give me was, you know, a lot of times they felt like, they were in a black box, right? Like they didn't really know what was going on on the day to day. They didn't really have control. Um, so sometimes they felt really out of the loop. And I think their conclusion was they preferred having the direct ownership where it's like, if they wanted control, they would be able to have it. Um, and just picking on that sentiment, like we felt that through a lot of, you know, customers and people we were talking to where it's like, people actually want power these days. Like they want agency to do like what they want with their money and not just like park it behind some like trust or fund where they don't really know what's going on. Um, so that mentality is, is a really big, you know, core part and envision behind our platform is empowering people to have direct ownership, even if it's a fraction of it. And the name fractional. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I like that. You're absolutely right. I mean, nowadays when I invest, it's like, I'm not going to go for a traditional agency or whoever broker that just puts into a 401k that I don't even know what my returns are because I think a lot of us are getting more financially educated and we realize that you know a lot of this performing stocks for index funds and what whatnot it's like if you bundle enough good and bad things together it's going to perform over time <laughs> with most likely because of inflation you know <laughs> so it's yeah it's just, the graphs are always going to go up so i really like the fact that you're giving a lot of us ownership and finding partnerships through your platform so i'm kind of curious too like so you got the product going you got people to sign up you got the idea of how the business is going to run now you apply to y combinator what was that process like and what was your y combinator experience like yeah, overall, it was it was a really great experience. Um, I would say like our application process was pretty standard. 
Um, I'm sure, you know, every company that goes through YC had a very similar process. Um, but after we got in, it was definitely, you know, such an engaging and powerful community to be a part of. Um, you know, lots of other founders being able to work through problems together, being able to meet with our partners and, you know, just feel like there's someone you can always lean on whenever, you know, you're kind of having some hiccups and just knowing that like you can fight through this together and there's people along with you on the journey that in itself, it, you know, it just felt so comforting. Um, and, and it really, I think, gave me and Carlos a lot of empowerment to, to always keep pushing forward. Um, and then all of that obviously led up to Demo Day, um, which was April of this year, um, where, you know, when we raised our seed round. So um, that was really like a thrilling experience, like pitching the company and everything that we've done pretty much for the last, you know, three months. Um, and then also got the opportunity to talk to investors that we never would have been before. Um, so for those who saw the recent news, um, we raised $5.5 million in funding um, from really great firms like CRV, Y Combinator, and also celebrities like Will Smith and Kevin Durant, who came from the YC network. Um, so that was, you know, incredibly fun. Um, I think it adds, you know, a lot of value to the company to have, you know, really trusted people um, just throughout, you know, nation, the world um, to, to back our company and be able to stand behind that. I love that. I love that a lot. And for our listeners, Y Combinator is a is a pretty uh, elite. I hate using the word elite. Pretty prestigious accelerator program out there. It's actually harder to get into this accelerator than like Harvard or Stanford, something like that. Uh, so congratulations to making it through the program and and getting such awesome people on your term sheet. Like that's amazing. Like Will Smith and Kevin Durant. Like, what was pitching to them like? Like. I just want to like get a scenario of like I think for me if I was pitching to them pitching to them I'll be like you know obviously very shocked and like, oh crap I don't know what to say but like what was your experience like when you when you talk when you talk to them and pitch them yeah I think pitching I usually think it's around the same for every investor right like they just want to see you know why you're building this and why you're the right person and why you have the right team to build exactly what it is that you're doing. Um, so a lot of it was really just, you know, conveying the mission, demonstrating that we have product market fit and that we have founder market fit um, and, and showing, you know, how big, um, you know, this company can grow and what the potential look like and, you know, just really how much of a game changing solution we're, we're really bringing out there in terms of, you know, democratizing real estate ownership and, and real estate investing. Um, so I think that message in itself, it just spoke to so many investors. Um, people are obviously, you know, pushing for more ownership, um, higher financial literacy, real estate literacy, and, and really opening up this asset class that's been, you know, so private and so locked up. Um, so that message, I think in itself, it just resonated with, with a lot of our investors um, and them seeing that, you know, we came from a firm that our team is growing, that we've done so much in so little time. Um, I think that was also just very meaningful data to, to back the message. Yeah, shout, shout out to that too. And, you know, I, I read an article recently and not, not recently, but sometime this year is saying that venture capital money only goes to like 2.3% of all female, uh, uh, like women founder out there and like even less like women of color. Right. So like, man, shout out, like you guys are improving the statistic for sure. So <laughs> there's so many good things and it happens so rapidly too. Like, was there any one point where you sort of just caught yourself and be like, in, in the situation where you're like, well, like, what is, what's happening? What's going on here? Like, how do I feel like I'm in control? Right. Cause I think that that's, that happens a lot when things move too quickly. It's like, I'm pretty sure when your people are, people are throwing out like investment numbers at you and term sheets, you're like, is this good? Is it bad? I'm excited. I'm, I'm scared. Like, do I give up too much, too much equity control? Like how did you keep yourself sane throughout the entire process of like uncertainty learning yeah, I would imagine it's like you jumped off a, like a cliff. You're building a house as fast as you can as you're falling down, right? You're trying to you're trying to like, you know, be reasonable for your decision making. You're like, oh, give me a, give me a day, give me a few weeks, give me a few months. But in actuality, this whole thing happened in less than one year. So like, how did you piece together all of all the information so quickly and be like, okay, I think this is the best decision that we're going to go for? Yeah, that's a great question. I and I think I constantly like take time to just like try to like step back. Like I almost imagine myself like I'm kind of like extracting myself and putting myself in a vacuum to just like really like reflect and kind of like calm down to like check in with myself, see where things are and just like 
never lose track of like the bigger picture. Um, I think especially when things are moving really quickly, like you kind of get really caught up in the moment. There's like so many things going on um, and it does become a lot sometimes, but I think, yeah, just being able to like take a step back and like breathe and know, you know, why am I doing this? Like, what are my, what's like the end goal? Like, what is my mission? And, you know, all of this, it's leading up to that one way or another. Um, I think sometimes when you kind of like go too, too deep into a rabbit hole, you kind of like lose the overall vision and it kind of, you know, funnels down into funnels you into like a not so effective or productive path. Um, so I do kind of like practice that exercise when I, when I, whenever I start feeling like, you know, I'm going down a rabbit hole and that definitely, you know, helps me pick things back up. Um, and I, and I think another thing is just like knowing that I think a lot of times like decisions are reversible to some extent. Um, that's also how I push myself to make decisions quicker as well, where, you know, if I feel like if I can do this thing and it'll give me an answer. And if it's not the right answer, I can, you know, easily reverse that without, you know, too many side effects and just pick something else. It's better to just move fast and find the answer rather than kind of like struggle and overanalyze on hypotheticals. Um, so that's kind of like another, I guess, mental philosophy that I have uh, to, to help like pace myself and, and get me moving. Okay. That's, that's, let's talk a little bit. Let's talk more about that. I'm kind of curious too, like, Let's say, for example, like you're getting your term sheet, like how do how does those situations become reversible after you after you ink it or you make a verbal agreement? Yeah, I guess for term sheets, that in itself, like after you sign, it's not reversible per se. Um, but I don't I, I think, you know, there there is a science behind, you know, who's like the right people you want to have on the team versus, you know, what's the best possible number that you can get. Um, and, and it doesn't make sense to get like too tied into the weeds around those things. Right. Um, you know, it's like, maybe you don't have the best number this time, but if you have the right people, the next time, maybe you'll, you'll have an even stronger term sheet or, you know, something that's more founder friendly, for example. Right. Um, so those, I think those are like different ways to, to think about it. Um, it's, it's much more important to focus on like what the end goal it is and how you want to create the company and who's the right people. Um, to be a part of this journey rather than like being fixated on, you know, what, what might be best or, you know, being a little bit like greedy on numbers and all of that. Um, So I think, you know, being able to have that like holistic picture um, and just knowing, you know, there's, there's always going to be another thing, another fundraise next time. Um, So focusing on, you know, what's going to be the right things to do now to, to get you there. Yeah. I mean, I really love your, your mindset. It's so abundant. It's very, it's very apparent with your answers that you're like, okay, like there's, there's a lot more opportunities out there. I'm just, I'll just get better every single time. So I like to continuously improve in mindset too. And typically when we have a software engineers in this podcast, I feel like those like concepts that we learn from CS, like continuously <laughs> developing, continuous improvement, all that stuff is like flowed into how we make our decision making, you know? So yeah. I, I love that a lot. Um, so let's quickly talk about the vision that you have for Fractional. You know, what do you guys see yourself at the end of 2022, five years from now, 10 years from now? Like, what do you hope to accomplish, accomplish at each milestone? Yeah, I think right now, a lot of the focus is still, you know, how do we build a really engaging social platform and how do we build, you know, the most streamlined full service solution possible when it comes to being able to help people co-own investment properties together. Um, but further down the line, I think we've actually been very forward thinking as we've been building out this whole framework on how do we create, you know, the modern infrastructure um, to be the fractional ownership platform for any sort of asset that people, you know, want to break into and, and want to co-own with other folks. Um, so as an example, you know, franchises, art, private jets, vehicles, anything like that. Um, that, you know, is traditionally expensive, traditionally private, hard to get into, where it makes sense where you want to, you know, team up with people that you trust um, to co-own and co-operate um, on that together. Uh, so that's, you know, I think the big, big picture that we have. And whenever, you know, we're making design decisions today, um, always something that we keep in mind and something we, we strive towards building. I like that. It's a... Uh... It's, it's very decentralized <laughs> in some ways. 
<laughs> I, I really like that that approach and man like even listen to your story just now it's like i'm so fired up for what you guys are, are going to build in the future so i'm just i'm so invested now you know <laughs> just like it's i think it's a fantastic idea uh, so for this part we typically kind of ask like people on our show like how do you guys take care of your mental health right because that is a big big issue that we like to cover in a podcast a lot it's being a founder is not easy like we're hearing the best things right now like on this podcast we're hearing the most exciting things but like most founders journey there's a lot of dark lonely times where you're just feeling really sad and you don't know who to talk to and you feel like your mental health is going to crap because there's just so many things going on yeah so i know you i know you sort of alluded to this earlier but are you in touch with yourself and everything are you you know asking yourself certain questions but like to certain to more like stressful situations how do you handle those types of situations and how do you make sure that your your mental health is is in a good state yeah totally i think that you know keeping yourself in a good mental state i think one of you know the biggest priorities of being a founder as well right like you have to be you have to be okay and strong in order to empower other people to be to be strong um so i think at least for me like i've really like never given up like spending time with my family and my friends like no matter how busy I am and I still kept like personal hobbies um I I don't think it's you know super healthy where all of a sudden you kind of give up everything around you and you put yourself in like a bubble where you're only working on your on your company um especially you know when you do hit, you know, difficulties, like you want to have a support system that you're able to lean on um, and other things that are personal to you. That's, you know, not the company and not the business that you can always go back to and and be able to kind of, you know, reset yourself and and put yourself in the right, in the right space. Um, So that's something that I've, you know, pushed myself to do. Um, So even in terms of, you know, how I spend my weeks, like I always make sure I'm spending time with my parents, with my friends um, and, I kind of mentioned in the beginning, um, I still do, you know, play violin. It was part, a big part of my life growing up and I still really enjoy music. Um, so I do, you know, find time for myself to, you know, pick up the violin every now and then like make some songs, like, you know, make sure I'm still having a life outside of that. Um, and just, you know, making sure that I'm, I'm happy and I'm motivated, um, in terms of, you know, personal growth and how I feel outside of running a company as well. Yeah. I really like that answer a lot. And what I call those are I call those are non-negotiables. So these, these things have to happen, like regardless of how busy you are. So it's like everyone operates in a different way. I'm glad that you're spending a lot of time with your friends and family. My non-negotiable, it's like I have to read 30 minutes a day. I don't, I don't care how busy I am. I don't care how tired I am. I don't care if it's in the middle of the night or 4 a.m. I have to pick up a book and read because this is what makes me happy. You know, I never, this is the part where I can totally like, let go of all, all the stress throughout the day and be like, this is my zone. This is my happiness. I'm reading whatever book I'm reading, you know, but I'm really glad that we all have these non-negotiables that keep ourselves sane. Yeah. I love that word. I'm going to start using it. <laughs> I did, so for, for clarification, I did not, I did not coin this term. I got this from whatever book I was reading at the time. It's like, these are my non-negotiables. I'm like, oh, that's an awesome word. And now I can't even credit the person because it's like, what book is it from again? I forgot. <laughs> you read too many books. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, as we're nearing the end of the podcast, like, I'm, I'm kind of curious, like, do you have any new features that are coming out pretty soon that you want to announce our community or our listeners right now that we're excited to see? Yeah, well, we recently launched um, our social platform. So would love to have everyone, you know, check it out, join our community. I think it's a great way to meet other real estate investors, um, especially, you know, if you're starting new, I think it's a great way to check out what other people are building. Um, you know, even mentors for your next project and join them. Um, so we'd love everyone to, to check that out. Um, yeah, definitely join the community. Uh, we have one, especially for Asian investors in the real estate community, um, Settle Asian Real Estate. So giving a plug for that as well here. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, you guys definitely check that out. So we have two final questions. One of them being, um, if you have an advice for an aspiring entrepreneur to get started and have everything rapidly happen so quickly in less than a year, what advice would that be? Um, I think the most important one is, I would say it's like to focus on your personal growth and always be ready for the opportunity. Um, I think, especially for my journey, like 
I feel like I always felt like at one point I was going to be an entrepreneur and start something on my own. Um, but there's always like so much noise around you, right? Like people are constantly building things, they're working on new opportunities. And sometimes you might feel like, you know, am I not like cut out for this? Like how come, you know, everyone's doing this and I'm not yet, et cetera. Um, but I think it's really good to just always check in with yourself and know that, you know, you're growing as a person and as an aspiring entrepreneur and you're, you're setting up yourself for success in terms of acquiring the right skill sets to network to build whatever it is that you want to in the future. It's really just a matter of timing. You know, there's no point in doing something for the sake of doing something. You need the right idea. You need the right co-founders and the timing needs to work for a product to, to really blow up at, you know, at a, at a certain time in the world. Um, but you need to be ready for those opportunities, right? So I think a lot of it is focusing on yourself um, and not getting, you know, overwhelmed or feeling like, you know, there's imposter syndrome or, you know, you're not cut for this or anything like that, just because other people are. Um, it's, it's really about like gearing yourself up so that when that opportunity and when the right people are around you, you're really ready to strike um, and make the best out of it. I love that. Stay ready, guys. The opportunity, you just never know it's going to come. So as long as you continuously improve yourself, you're going to see more and more opportunities. Right. And there's, I really like that. Like, like, again, continuous improvement mindset that you have and the abundance mindset is so prevalent in everything that you do. So I love it. Um, so I guess the final question is how can our listeners learn more about fractional and yourself? How can we get involved and download this app to you to yourself? Yeah, well, feel free to visit our website. Um, it's fractional.app. Um, you'll basically see everything about our company, how to get involved, um, there's also a way to chat with me directly through the website as well. If anyone wants to, to book time with me to learn more about how the platform works and what my journey has been like, all of that. Um, also feel free to follow us on social media platforms or on Instagram, Twitter. Um, so those are great resources to, to, to keep in touch. Awesome. Well, we'll leave that all in the show notes. Stella, amazing story. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was so fun. And I guess tying it all together to that background that you have. Always, always hustling. hustling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. All right. We'll see you all next time.